Good afternoon. I'm Ken Hirsch, Manager of Computing Services and a Senior Lecturing Fellow at the Duke University School of Law. And I'm going to allow each of our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves, starting with Alex Albright. I'm Alex Albright, and I am the Associate Dean for Students in Technology and Senior Lecturer at the University of Texas School of Law. I am, um, my title has always been a challenge. I think I'm really the Associate Dean for Crisis Management. I have been the um, Acting Assistant Dean for Career Services when we had a career services crisis. I was Associate Dean for Students when I was supposed to fix a few things in student affairs, and our latest crisis has been um, technology, and so that's why I'm now Associate Dean for Technology as well. I teach Texas Civil Procedure. I'm a lawyer. I am not a techie at all. Um, I, I'm really approaching this more from a management point of view, and I rely on um, other people like June Liebert here to tell me what needs to be done from a technical point of view. Mark? Good morning. I guess it's afternoon now. Um, I'm Mark Bergeron. I'm from the University of Florida Levin College of Law. Um, so you can kind of get a perspective of where our backgrounds are from. I support 1,200 students, sometimes up to 1,300 students um, at all times. I support 350 workstations. Um, our department is directly under the library. We started there. I was hired in 1986 to manage 26 computers. And at that time, to create a plan to provide a computer, printer, and workstation and applications to everyone in the law school who wanted to use a computer. Phil? I'm Philip Bull. I'm from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. Um, I'm a law librarian and uh, somehow someone found out I could plug in toasters and turn on microwaves, that sort of thing. So I'm also in charge of the, uh, the IT at uh, Pepperdine. Uh, like everybody here, I think uh, the uh, the job has grown into a lot more, and that's you know that's why I wanted to participate in this. And one of our goals this morning is to make this more than just a session in which we can commiserate, but but uh, really a roundtable discussion where not only the panelists but you and the audience can help with positive suggestions on things that work for you and have made your life, if not easier, at least more bearable and have improved productivity. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn the first task over to Phil. You want to click for me? I'll be glad to. All right. I, just to get a sense of the demographics here, I wanted to see um, how many librarians we had in the room. Oh, lots. <laughs> okay, how many, how many dedicated IT staff, not librarian IT, just, just IT? Okay, so we can talk about you. Uh, and deans. Oh, a few deans. Okay. We got, okay. So I think the librarians have the deans outnumbered. All right. Okay, how many of you spend much, if not most, of your time under tables and desks fiddling with cables? Okay. I know I spend most of my time there. Okay. You get a wireless system. <laughs> I have a wireless system. Okay. Do you have wireless power? Larry. Who let Larry in? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I just want to go over briefly what we're going to try to touch on. I don't know how hot the room gets and how many people start to throw things, but uh, we want to talk about staffing issues, IT and non-IT uh, projects and, and duties. You know how to how to balance special projects with your regular duties. That's never been a problem, right? Uh, system planning. I don't think we should have put the word planning in there. Does anybody have a plan? And justification, and then uh, we have a special uh, guest who's going to do a top ten list of things we wish uh, our deans knew. So, go ahead. What? We got the staffing. Okay, we're going to split staffing issues into two sections. I'm going to first talk about IT staff, but then there's also the issue of your uh, law school staff, and Alex will take over when I'm finished with the IT staffing. Um, I had a lot of pet peeves, because uh, I grew up with the uh, computing in the law school all the way from the very beginning when we first started. Um, I may have some issues that a lot of you have already overcome, I don't know, but if, I, if you haven't, I hope I can give some help. Um, 
I think it's real important to get your computing staff, IT staff, uh, staff with qualified people and enough people to do the job that you're expected to do. Um, I think that you can help your dean do that by coming up with a plan of what areas of expertise are you going to provide service in. Um, you need to address, are you going to support special projects? What kind of special projects and how far those special projects can go? Um, faculty web page creation and maintenance, that needs to be addressed and it's becoming much more prevalent in our school. One-on-one um, -on -one support, how far do you go? What point do you stop and hire another student assistant or um, a faculty um, assistant to help the professor do what his special project is or even in a department? How far do you go with a special project? Um, how far do you go with database creation, maintenance, user training, and support? Do you do it in-house, or do you turn it over to a department once you get it started, or do you let the department do their own thing? You need to make all these decisions up front. And if you can have a plan, then you can give your dean solutions to solve the problems instead of whining about it or complaining about it. Come up proactive with answers, then he can support you. Um, one of the questions I have that I always have to deal with is how many IT staff do we have? Is it enough to do a good job? Well, no, I don't know that it ever is enough to do a good job because we're always asked to do more. No matter how much we do, we're always asked to provide more support. Um, once we have good support, how do we keep them? So retaining staff is important to us. Um, right now, I have six and a half people. Of those, two and a half are completely temporary. And one of those temporary persons has worked for us for six years. <laughs> it just is an ongoing, ongoing thing. Um, I don't know, we're a public university. We have to go through a very strenuous process to get new positions allocated to our department. And that's been a real problem for us and continues to be. We don't see a, a solution anywhere near. Um, well, you can keep people by traditional methods, holidays, vacations, health care, insurance, and retirement plans. But if you're hiring temporary people, and you continue to do that like we are, you can't offer that retentivity incentive. And we find that we train an awful lot of people, and then other departments on campus even steal them away if it isn't an outside organization. So if I were able to tell my dean, you're, you need to be aware that uh, information technology might pay different scales of pay and have other benefits than other parts of the law school. And it may need to be addressed separately. And sometimes I think that may be a problem with administration is they don't realize that. Um, other areas that you could retain your staff might be in certification and training. Um, I think that uh, if you keep your people trained by sending them out for outside professional training, that increases your efficiency and productivity in helping your users. Um, even attending conferences like Cali. I've learned a lot being here today in the last three days. I've picked up several things I'm going to take back. Um, telecommuting. Can you improve your productivity of your people if you allow them to work sometimes from home? Some things can be done from home and can be done more efficiently because you're not going to be interrupted as much. Job classification. Again, no temporaries. Um, I have a real problem. I don't know how many others have gotten stuck in this, but because I've been where I've been for so long, um, I'm in what's called an IT wedgie. Um, my job started out maintaining 26 IBM XT computers. But it's, not, it's a lot different now. My job classification has never changed. My salary increases have been mostly what the state allows. But how do you overcome that? Um, <laughs> quit. <laughs> go to work for threatening to quit and go forward for another department seems to work, but that's, that's not the kind of game I like to play. But that's always an issue, is how do you retain IT staff? Um, when you plan your productivity, uh, what are the true costs of productivity? Um, if you're asked to provide support for a special product, there's a lot of costs that are often overlooked. Um, there's obviously hardware, usually obviously software, but there's interaction time with existing systems and software solving any interaction issues. There's the testing of that involved with the interaction. Uh, you have to train your support staff to support these new areas 
of special projects, and you have your end user training and then end support. Um, and the one thing that isn't hard to, that, that isn't easy to put down paper is the time that it takes to move from I'd like to support a special project to actually making that special project happen and take place. Um, wireless for us has been one of those issues from planning to implementation. We hope to get our wiring in place over the summer before fall classes start, but we're already behind schedule. Uh, lastly, um, I'd like to mention that um, workspace and storage space has been a real problem for us as well. Um, with technology, I'm finding that a lot of issues, a lot of things we purchase have one year and up to three year warranties, and a lot of times you can't get a warranty unless you ship something back in the original box. That wastes an awful lot of space, and you have to have the space to keep track of these boxes. We've managed to find some of that space, and every box that comes in, we date it when it came in and when it can be thrown away with the date facing forward so that we can keep inventory of our empty boxes of all things. <laughs> but that takes space, and often that isn't thought of in advance to plan for that kind of space. Um, that's all I can think of for right now. Uh, any questions about IT stuff? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any fire hazards? Any what, I'm sorry? Fire hazard issues. Uh, uh, overhead water sprinkler systems like you have in here in the rooms. Yes, sir. Well, I have a comment related to the staffing uh, salary parity. I just posted a uh, webmaster, reposted a webmaster position that I had posted last year at the conference. And I don't know how many of you actually looked at that posting, but it wasn't exactly a uh, high paying job. Um, but I had this gift from my dean of, uh, of a new position for a webmaster, and it was fully funded. Um, the thing is, is nobody wanted to work for $30,000 a year as a webmaster in Malibu, California. <laughs> you, would think, you would think that that would be enough to get someone out there uh, because of all the other uh, psychic dollars you, know, you get from working in Malibu. But, so we actually went through the hiring process. I did a lot of leveraging. Um, I was able to get a concession up to $39,000 a year, which, you know, that's a pretty killer salary in Los Angeles for an IT job. So uh, don't believe me. Okay. At any rate, uh, we got somebody really close who was looking for a change of life, who uh, was a very highly paid IT professional. And uh, somebody else came in at the same time and, and bid higher. And so now I'm in an even better position because we had a good candidate who didn't come because of the money. And so now they're thinking about, well, maybe we should just recreate that position. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're dealing with right now is suddenly realizing at the law school that IT people want to be paid. One thing that we have had is in Austin, we had lots of dot coms, so we could we were having a hard time hiring people and keeping people for a while, and we get a lot of our people from the main campus, and they were having a huge problem. Well, now that bubble has burst, and we have, are not having that problem. There's not as much turnover, so um, staff is is easier. Um, you know, the answer to the, all these questions, I think, is money, obviously, and we have just instituted an IT fee as a state university. The legislature sets our um, our tuition, which is very low, but we do have some flexibility with fees, and so we just instituted a fee that's going to give us, I think, was it five hundred thousand dollars a year? Um, so we suddenly have the flexibility for hiring people, and the students have been told that it's primarily going to be for staffing. Um, we have a lot of triage to do before we get to that point, but um, but. Having the money has made a huge difference. So you might suggest fees if you can. Part one thing I do to justify new IT people with my need is uh, I will always write out what I expect this new person to do and why the existing people we have on staff can't do that. And I have a meeting with my dean and give him that ahead of time. Uh, he has a chance to look it over and, and, and write down any questions he might have. And then when we actually meet face to face, uh, I then uh, justify it to him and he has those notes to go, those questions to ask. And that's really the best way if you, if you can convince uh, the dean that uh, this is a service that people are demanding 
faculty who manage, students are demanding. You have no one else on staff that can do it or do it as efficiently as a new person. Uh, they, they, you know, my dean has been very reasonable once I lay out the full justification for what I need and why I need that person. Uh, I think that documentation is very critical. Mm -hmm. One thing I did recently was I awoke from a, a stupor of several years of hiring uh, student workers like a mad person. And I had over 30 student workers uh, working for me. And I was still primarily responsible for managing them all. I mean, managing. Uh, what, what I ended up doing was um, laying off of all but about four of them and then hiring part-time and, and one full-time person to take care of those dudes, primarily lab management. Um, helping people underline that kind of stuff, keeping the printers full. It was kind of, a, I mean, we're spending a lot of money on student workers, and so we're sort of fading uh, in full time positions by rewriting student worker money, and that's working out pretty well so far. And now we've, I think we've faked the dean out sufficiently to where uh, we'll uh, turn those into real uh, uh, positions instead of uh, like a, more like a temp position. But those temp positions can be pretty good. We have have a guy with a master's now in library science and I can't remember what all else, but we are hiring him temporarily for $11 an hour for the summer. And so you, know, you can get some really good cheap work for temporary and kind of try them out and see if they, if they work and then maybe hire them later. So we also use it kind of as a trial run. There are a lot of graduate students in Austin that are interested in doing some of this stuff. Alex, what are some of the issues you face with um, non-IT non -IT. staff? Non-IT. I'm sorry, did you switch and I didn't know? Oh, um, just go with the flow. I'm going to tell you all a story about non-IT stuff. Um, we have a lot of data on a mainframe that has to be that can be accessed from different departments, um, and one download that had to be done every year was the Career Services Office had to download alumni for mailing labels one time a year. So every year they couldn't remember how to do it, they couldn't remember their password, and they would go to our data processing person who had been there for 14 years and say, "I need." my password and I can't remember how to do this, would you help me one more time? And she finally went ballistic. This woman just said, I can't believe you idiots. Why can't you remember your password and why can't you remember how to do this and I'm not going to help you again. You just have to figure it out for yourselves. That's why the Dean of Crisis Management got called into this situation. So. Um, so career services didn't have their their mailing labels. This woman was furious and wouldn't talk to career services for six months. And um, this was before I got involved, and, but I would hear about it. And um, so, uh, you know, we clearly had a problem. Okay, what's the problem here? Well, one, we had a really rude woman at um, data processing who is no longer there. That was one of the first things I did is I got her moved to a different part of the university. And um, and if there's anything that I could tell as a dean to tell IT people is you all have got to say, do everything you can to say yes. If you can't say yes, explain why you can't say yes because we are much a better able to accept no when we know that there's a reason. It's not just because you don't want to do it. And then... Um, uh, be flexible when you can. And so this woman was, you know, the most unflexible human being in the world, and it was really a bad situation. A lot of work at the law school was was very difficult um, because of it. And we found out that also she kept telling us that she was not replaceable, that um, nobody in the whole world could read this data um, because she had invented these systems. And um, the previous dean had believed this and would not do anything to make her angry, and that's why she could get away with this kind of um, behavior. Um, but we, when we had her transferred, we found out um, she was very replaceable, and um, a lesson we have learned is that when someone tells you they're not replaceable, then that's a good indication that they're very replaceable and you probably should replace them. So. Um, so we learned a lot from that experience. But um, we, I think you know, from that you can see, one, users do need training. 
and users do need a friendly interface. And so whose responsibility is all this? Well, the interface has to be the responsibility of the IT people. You need to make as friendly an interface um, as you can. Um, but the, the departments also need to take some responsibility for training. And I think you know, this needs to be the non-IT people and the IT people working together to develop what do we need for training, what do we need for an interface, do we want to have training sessions, do we want to have online training, do we want to have manuals, and that's what we're spending a lot of time on now is, is trying to work with the different departments and figure out what their needs are and continue to work with them and be flexible and having um, a cooperative relationship. Um, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, the dean has to put um, his or her power behind the need for training. People will not go to training unless the dean says, you have got to do this, this is an important thing. And our dean is very interested in improving our technology, and, um, and I have no doubt that that's going to happen. Um, another thing, I want to make a plug for librarians. I think li I have stolen librarians um, to my technology department. Um, and I think librarians are really good at this because their mindset, their culture is to help people find information. Um, and that's what this technology is about, is to help people help themselves. And it's really been great to have librarians like June um, to help make all this happen. I want to talk a little bit about various competing interests and, uh, for your time and money. Uh, everyone in your staff, whether it's you the manager or the front level help desk person, has basically two types of work. Things they've got to get done every day and special projects. And it can be very difficult allotting time between these two. And it really comes down to um, what, what staff do you have available to you and allocating their time. And one of the best things you can do to, to learn how you can allocate staff is to first of all develop a skills inventory. And you need to know, and your staff needs to know, who among them is capable of doing certain things. Also, by having that skills inventory, when the dean does come up with a project for you, if you don't have someone with that skill set, you can say, I don't have someone who's capable of doing that. We'll either have to bring on someone, go outside and have it done outside, or allocate the time and money to train one of the existing staff people in that skill set. And which of those is best for any given situation is going to vary upon what your local situation is. And it's going to be affected by things like what kind of money you have available, what will be left undone if you take an internal person and turn over their responsibility to something else? Outsourcing decisions are tough ones that everyone's called upon to do every, either frequently or every now and then, but we hear about it more and more. And um, certainly the, for most of us who are in the positions we are, we generally think having the majority of your work done in-house is the most efficient way to have it done and the best way to maintain working control over what goes on. But at the very least, you will find projects where you just don't have the time and the staff who can handle it, and you will be going outside for either consultant work, design work, what have you. Deans need to be aware of that, and you're the one who has to make them aware of that in any given situation, the solution may be different than it was the last time. Standardization. And right off the bat, we can talk about standardization of software. I think Mark's going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes and other standardization. But what I'm thinking about is standardization of procedures. If you find something that works right, that's good. But if no one else knows about it, they're not going to do it the same way again. So you want to have manuals. Uh, we have a manual of disaster preparedness, so if something out of the ordinary should happen and one of us isn't around who, who does the backup, there's a book to open up that tells you what do I do next when this happens? What happens if all the data disappears from a server? Can you answer that question? Yeah, yeah what, that page isn't quite full on our manual. Can you help us with it? No, it's very good. Um, we, we have a, Becky Mangan does that very well for us. 
project funding is something that is very crucial as well as day-to-day -day funding and I am very fortunate at Duke. We have, ever since the time I've been in this position and, and before that I'm sure, had a budgeting process which has separate capital and operating budgets. And the operating budgets are what get your salaries through and your office supplies and your travel and so forth. And then we have a separate capital budget which pays for any single item that's $500 or more, which means anything from the desktop up to the server or the wiring closets comes out of the capital budget. And we have to do our capital budgets out seven years. Now, I can't say for sure what I need to buy next year, much less five years or seven years from now, but I do know that the server I bought this year isn't going to last forever, so I can estimate, and if you all don't have your own schedules, I'll be glad to share mine with you, how long a server should last, how long a desktop should last, you just say, you know, and that will change from time to time, the processor speed is finally outpacing application development, so we may have to revise that. But you name the thing you're replacing, you stick it in the budget, and somebody in the administrative offices is putting aside the, the money so that when that year comes, three or four years from now, you don't have to go begging for the money. You say, look, I have the money right here. Let's go buy the server and upgrade things. So if you don't have a long-term capital budget, start one right away. Wow. Talk to your dean. If you don't report directly to the dean, talk to your supervisor and, and, and emphasize the dean. If, if, if it's a university-wide problem, then your school needs to get on the ball and talk to the central university administration. It's beyond me how any large institution can function and not have a strategic plan and a long-term capital budget. So if you don't have one, you need to talk to the powers that be and persuade them and team up with your fellows from across campus who are in the same boat. Well, we have a new IT vice president for the university and they started something pretty interesting. They now, they call it a faculty computer initiative and so we, they buy enough machines to give a quarter of the tenure tenure track faculty new machines every four years and we only pay 25 percent of that but so that gets a lot of money from the university to buy a substantial number of computers for us every year we still have a lot more computers that we have to buy but that also since the university started this planning you know every four years you get a new computer that makes it much easier for us to tell our dean we need to plan that for the secretary the student organizations and things like that. Time commitments and project timelines. Project timelines, I don't know what your rule of thumb is, but my rule of thumb on a short-term project like something I'm hoping to do in the office today is if it involves a computer and I think it's going to take two hours, multiply that by two because something always goes wrong. When you're looking at longer-term projects, things like major upgrades, redoing a website or whatever, Regardless of what, what, how long you think it's going to take, I'm not saying multiply by two works in every instance, but build in the unexpected. Build in time for the downtime. Build in, build in the possibility that your lead employee is going to be out sick. Build in the fact that people, as much as some, some of us think we can, and certainly as much as some of the people who supervise us think we can, we cannot work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and be living human beings who are rational most of the time. And going on to that is staff commitments. While I certainly agree with Alex that we should strive to say yes, we must indeed learn to say no when appropriate. But say why. And say why, exactly. Say why, because that why might get you the other person to help you do the job. You cannot do everything and be everything to everybody. If you haven't learned that by now, it's time to start learning it. Because if you yourself believe you can do everything for everybody, you will be a department of one for the rest of your life. So say no, but when you say it, say it pleasantly and explain why you have to say no. Yep. Any, any comments or discussion on that issue? Saying no is fine. Let's talk a minute about planning and justification. And uh, if anybody has any comments, feel free to jump in. Uh, standardization. Uh, how many of you would agree that standardization is, a, is a, at least a portion of your strategic plan? Okay. Well, that's the view hopefully will convince. 
uh, you know, just a few days ago, I'm, I'm bringing on a, a, someone in addition to our current uh, staff. Fortunately, we're, at, we're adding people left and right the last few months. And this, uh, this particular guy is really gung-ho about technology, and he's all ready to jump on the uh, Compaq, I is it the IPAC? Yes. And uh, the thing is, is we are quite a ways down the road into the palm world. And I'm thinking, oh, no, my, my, uh, my number two in command is going to be using a completely different handheld, and uh, I'm going to have to explain to all our deans and directors that are using palms why Slick here has uh, this color, you know, thing that can do all this stuff. So he feels a little bit restrained when I say, uh, you know, Tom, if you're going to get compact eye packs, I'd appreciate it if you get them for everyone. And so um, if he's going to come, come to the party, he's going to have to bring a, a new standard in. But uh, we are stuck in the palm world, and I'm not really unhappy about that. But uh, I just cannot fathom not just supporting two different platforms for a handheld, but um, you know I spent a lot of time building up the Palm, and uh, and and built a lot of capital in with our deans and some of our top directors at the law school, and then ha to have uh, something else come in right in my own organization that sort of steps out of that because we use our stuff all the time. We're always forever pulling it out of our pockets uh, in different people's offices and revealing our palms to them. But uh, that's just a, a little vignette on standardization. Include the IT unit. Have you ever had someone added to, um, say, the faculty or um, a secretary somewhere and not known about it and get some irate phone call? How come uh, Sukhet doesn't have um, uh, Internet access, and she doesn't have email, and uh, by the way, she doesn't have a phone either. Okay. Well, how long has she been? Well, she's been here a week. I don't. I didn't know. I, by the way, I don't do phones. Uh, I'm starting to do phones now, just because nobody else is. But um, wouldn't it be nice if people would let you know when people uh, were added to the staff at the law school, particularly if you're expected to do something and didn't even know about it? Uh, so that's something that you know we're communicating uh, with our with our dean and deans. Uh, it'd be nice if we were in the loop, you know, when somebody's added to the staff at the at the law school. Uh, office we, changes. So. We just found out that they were going to redo classrooms, and nobody was going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so there's sin everywhere, Holly. <laughs> Well, we want you to connect the scanner. What scanner? The one we just bought. Well, we've, and we've been very running into, and it's a USB scanner. Right. Or, or the thing is, is, like, we need this particular application, and we've already contracted with the vendor for this application, but now you guys have to make it. Yes, we've been. Chris services and admissions application, a calendaring system. <coughs> we have purchased the license, and we've talked to the vendor, and we have to make it. Early on, when our department was created, um, one of the first things we did was was able to get through, and it's pretty much observed nearly 99% of the time that nobody, regardless of whose money they could spend, and if our faculty have significant discretionary funds, can buy any computer-related item, including a printer, without clearing it through me. Yeah, I, I was I was the worst defender on this. I was one of those who would take my FDA and run down to Office Depot and whatever I saw looked cool and fun, I would buy it and then plug it in without telling our computer people because they told us we had to be standardized, but they didn't say why. It was like, you cannot install your own software on our system. And that was it. And I thought, I do it at home? I'll do it here. And I want it. And I would say, I wanted something. They'd say, no, we don't support that. You can't have it. And say, well, I want it, so I know how to pull it, put it in, so I put it in. And then they'd come in and they'd flip out, and I had front page on, and they told me, you have become a server to the world on the network. And so, you know, they've 
all these awful things were going to happen to me. Um, but what I told them after a while is I said, you know, if you would just tell me why I can't do this, tell me that there's something that you would prefer me to have, I, then I'll do that. But you all just say no, 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 no with no whys. And that's why I keep pushing the why, is tell me why, and then I'll buy into your rules. But if you just tell me no, I'm going to do what I want to do. So, um, and, and we just had a kiosk incident. Our alumni foundation um, bought a kiosk that appeared by the front door the day before reunion with a database for these bricks. We can buy bricks with our names on it for X hundred dollars. And so it has this database where you couldn't search the database by last name because they had this person do it who didn't have anything to do with us and she didn't know how to put together a database, but they had her do it. And um, then it worked for about 20 minutes or an hour, and then somebody slapped a piece of paper on it that says, down for repairs, and it's been like that for three or four months. But we have not been able to touch it because it's the Alumni Foundation's computer kiosk. Finally, last week, I got... Um, I got control of it, so now it's June's kiosk, and she's so thrilled to have it. Um, and then just the day before we came down here, the alumni person came running into June's office and said, the dean says the first thing that has to be done is to fix that database because he hates having that kiosk with the sign on it. Well, I said, that's ridiculous. We've got you know, all these other things we have to do this summer. And so I sent the dean an email on the, from the... Um, as soon as I got here, and I got an email back, and he says, all I did was mention that I didn't like having the sign on the kiosk, that there, it was broken and nothing was being done about it. So that's another thing that deans need to know, is when you mention things, people think it's high up on your priority list, and it really may not be. And so you need to be very clear about your expectations. Is this something that's just bugging you at that second, or do you really want everybody to drop everything? And go, well, no. Polly? Well, I think in this issue, what really makes a difference is, is just how you work within the law school. I mean, whether it's the frontline people or it's the senior administrators, is if you want to make sure that you're, there is an IT, you know, is included as you're planning a project, either in dean's meetings, you know, if, if your dean meets with his, you know, um, other administrators, that's a time that you can keep asking this question and educate other administrators. Or there ought to be a time when everybody, you have to visit every office anyway, that's when you make your informal relationships and then you work on those informal networking <coughs> you know, so what's going on, what do you need, you know, it really would help us so that you're not doing it at crisis time and saying, why didn't you tell us, but you're planting the seed and you're building a connection or a network that you can have respect for each, you know, what do you need, what are you trying to do that, that makes your organization or you unit work better? What can we do to help you with the infrastructure and then get it early on the planet? Exactly, yeah. Any other comments on that? How, how many of you have very busy summers in your building? Okay, was it always like that? No. Uh, it wasn't like that for us. It was for us always. Well, you're special, though. <laughs> uh, over the last probably five years, our university discovered that the law school was kind of empty during the summertime, and they were going to change that. And at the same time, the law school discovered that the law school was kind of empty in the summertime, and they were going to change that. So we have lots and lots of programs going on during the summertime. Some of them add to our user uh, list, and some of them just add to the number of bodies in the building. But um, that's the time when we would vacuum the insides of PCs. We would, you know, rebuild the servers, rebuild the lab images, do all that sort of thing. Now we cannot get four days in a row. We can shut things off. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, we are lobbying very strenuously with the university, uh, central people who, you know, plan the building space, and, uh, and our own uh, administration at the law school. Hey, we need a week here. We need a couple weeks there to, to take care of things. And, you know, like Ken says, you know, when you, when you find yourself inside a, a server four or five hours and discover, you know what, I'm not anywhere close to being done. And you got to be done. You got to be there all weekend. Wouldn't it be nice to go home at night and come back in the morning? 
Uh, well, we, yeah, for some things you can mirror a server, but if you're going to tear down a lab, um, you can't mirror a lab very easily. Um, maybe the server is not a great example, but we are able to mirror a lot of things, but you can't mirror everything. And uh, uh, gone are the days of, of leisure and, and relaxation in the summertime. I have I'm being question. facetious. I have another question on planning. Like with the, the new versions of operating system and uh, software, like for example, Microsoft, every, you could say practically every six months there might be something else coming up. Mm -hmm. So how do you allow the training for the staff and purchasing requirements for the faculty? We don't have a central plan at the university and the law school has followed that lead. <laughs> and uh, we are, you know, shining examples of, of that. Uh, we have, I've been working on trying to get the university and the law school to adopt uh, a plan for that kind of stuff. And uh, just like uh, Texas has, we've got a new vice president of planning and technology. And uh, that's only, a, that position's only a few months old. Uh, we, our new, a new president came in and sort of swap things around. So we're in the process of developing that right now. And fortunately, uh, we're, we're being heard and we feel really good about that. And let me follow up on that. We have a training committee that's, uh, which actually covers more than training, but its name is Training Committee, which includes uh, most of our, our uh, customer assistance staff, myself, the head of information services in the library. We'll include the director of educational technology, um, and is at least visited, if not regularly, at least occasionally by my boss, the senior associate dean. And when we learn from, through the trade press or, or news list or whatever of what Microsoft and its other companies are coming out with, we start taking a look at it ourselves. We know that others on campus are taking a look at it. And we bring to the attention of the training committee something's coming down the road that we've got to start thinking about. And we attempt to set up inside testing, but we often can't get enough inside testing done before we have to start rolling something out. We generally adopt the policy that we stay one version behind on most desktops as to what somebody's come out with, because it usually, as most, if not all of you know, takes the first service pack before they get it really working well, and the second service pack before you're really happy with it, if you're ever going to be happy with it. But you've, you've also got, um, you, uh, you have to promote standardization as much as possible, but you also have to allow for some flexibility from the marketplace. So for example, all our desktops have both Corel and Office on them. Most of our faculty use Corel, most of our students use Office. That's the way it works in the real world, that's the way it's going to work in our law school for the time being. We are last and proud of it. We still have Windows 98 everywhere and we are just now rolling out 95. That's right, I have 98 on my laptop. It's, uh, so we have Windows 95 and on all of our computers except the ones that we are rolling out starting this summer will have Windows 2000 and we'll probably have Windows XP in 2010 or something. But, but we have learned that you know, there's the business school and engineering that are, want to be on cutting edge and they figure all this out. I think we need to be a little bit quicker than we have been, but, um, but we let them work the bugs out and then we adopt it. Um, like, like Ken, um, the College of Law at the University of Florida uh, was all Corel. Um, up until October, we, we finally said, okay, we need to do something. Because the students were all using, coming in with Microsoft Office Suite because they're buying computers. And so many computers today are coming with Microsoft products preloaded. And we as a law school had always been Corel and WordPerfect. Um, for a couple of years, I've been saying, we need to be doing something about this. We need to move in the direction of office and support it. But we really didn't have a good way of going about it. We finally overcame that. What I did was, is I put together a program where we would release the product to departments who had one person at least from each department go to a special training for the product so that that person could help support people within that department so that we had a plan 
of how to release the product. We weren't releasing it all at once, which would have created a terrible problem for support, trying to support everyone in law school, all of a sudden having a new product to use. Uh, but by releasing it as departments went to the training, worked out very well for us. And, and it finally got approved. We've, we now offer Corel and uh, Microsoft on every desktop in the school. One, one thing I just re remembered I need to say about our operating system thing is the Windows 95 has created a problem in the last year or so. Um, we realized that... Just in the last year? Just in the last year or so. Well, nobody, it, nobody cared. But they knew a problem in the last yeah, year. That's right. I mean, nobody knew. There was no central place for anybody to know of any problems. I'm sure there were problems. But we have just found out because of our new structure that over half, I believe, of the help questions that um, our... Our, C our computer information group, I can't remember what CIC stands for, but um, the, the help questions are somebody emailed me and a, wind a, a Microsoft Word document and I can't open it because we still have Word 97. And so it doesn't open Word 2000 documents and it doesn't open new Word Perfect documents. So we realized how much time CIC was spending just converting these documents, which is ridiculous. And so then we say, okay, we'll just put new version of Word. Well, we have all these old computers all over the place that won't support it, so that's why we're having to roll this out on new machines because we never had a system for upgrading machines, so uh, our machines are pretty old and we can't afford to buy them all at once, so it's going to be a gradual process. So that's just an instance for why planning is so important. We have a, a, a similar OS problem. About 20 years ago, somebody bought a phone switch at the university. Well, now it's time to get a new phone switch and a new phone system. And these guys have been planning to replace this for years, but they never knew when the money was going to become available. Well, all of a sudden, about two months ago, hey, we got funding. We're buying this new product. Well, the new product runs on Exchange 2000 under Active Directory. We are an NT shop. We are not using anything close to that level of sophistication as far as directory management. So. Apparently, we are switching to Active Directory uh, by July 15th. <laughs> okay. Now, those of you who know what Active Directory is, um, you know that I should be afraid. Those of you that don't, believe me, I'm very afraid. <laughs> uh, and, and so we have um, just, uh, you know, the law school has been managing its own domain, and now we're not going to be doing that because we're going to be part of this other, you know, Active, active Directory tree, and we have so many issues. And, and you know, this is one of those things where if there had been a plan, and there was sort of a plan, we need a new phone system, and we're going to get one that's going to work with Exchange. But uh, and, and now, now the plan is to you know be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> so that's what I'm look for, looking forward to on Monday when uh, when I get back. I think it can be deceptively easy to actually do a planning document. Um, even a simple meeting that you hold at the start of the summer that identifies maybe the, the 10 or 20 projects you want to accomplish, and make it a consensus document from the group of people that have, have, actually have to do this and attach names to it. So, it's, And I think that's all really a strategic plan is. Yeah. One goes from the summer, another one does a year, and another one does three years. So, so really, all of us really can do that, I think. Oh, it's not hard to do. It, the, the trick is to get everybody to buy into it, I think. And the other thing that's important from my perspective to be successful, it's I think the only way you can measure yourself, particularly uh, from a faculty perspective, is to see if you're getting a result, getting a successful result, and then to publish more web pages, put out course materials, use the discussion groups, provide a more enriching kind of curriculum to the students. And, and what I think is good, it helps me and we understand, is good comes from fire. By that I mean, uh, it's okay for there to be stress at the faculty level for things uh, that, that's troubling to do. I, I can't remember my password or I can't do these things. It's hard to learn things. It's really hard to learn things. But at some level, you got to get them to sort of make that jump up. And, and I'm fortunate. At Washington, I can get away with that. I can start a fire and then still survive and be very comfortable in my environment. 
I recognize not all law schools have that kind of fortunate situation. But, but I, I think it's important that the whole law school community be capable of sustaining fire. You know, that, that's got to happen. Otherwise, you never go anywhere. And in fact, you can actually do yourself serious damage by always saying yes, because you, you never get this stage of improvement where, where you're measuring yourself by results. So I would, I would strongly recommend sort of a, a, a fire kind of strategy. Yeah, but by saying always say yes, I mean, I meant cooperate. I did not mean the when the dean walks in and says, like our dean walked in and says, I think we need to go wireless and it needs to be done right away. It needs to be done this summer, and I think that's the coolest thing known to man. Well, you know, I like wireless myself too, but my staff is a little more skeptical than I. And um, so we've said, yes, we're going to test it in a place, and we're going to see how it works. And we'll, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff that people want to do, and they don't recognize the ramifications of it. And you can't just say yes to those. Um, I pushed through ExamSoft um, a couple of years ago when I was the I was doing some student affairs stuff, and you know I did what deans do that I now know I wouldn't, shouldn't do. I said, we're going to have exam soft. Some students have, have um, laptops. Why not let them do it? Let's just haul off and do it. Well, you know, then the fallout came. Where are all those students going to plug in their computers? Uh, well, we didn't think about that. Um, how is Student Affairs going to print out the, um, the exams? They're on Mac, and you can't use exam soft on Mac. Oh, well, gee, should have thought about that. But we didn't have the infrastructure to go to anybody to ask, really. And so now, hopefully, we... We do have that infrastructure, and people are thinking about asking. And um, and I think having me being the per one of the point people, I think, helps faculty because they trust me some to say we're not doing things just for tech's sake, and we're not going to have this complicated stuff that they can't operate. If I can operate it, they can operate it. I like your fire analogy. We, we uh, uh, in the fall semester, sort of with our eyes open, said, yeah, that's possible. We can do that to the, to the dean. And um, the project rapidly escalated beyond our ability to, to uh, manage it. And it ended up taking uh, what wasn't a large staff, uh, my entire staff, all semester t to work on. I can't say that it was ever actually completed. Uh, uh, server maintenance uh, didn't get done. Um, students' questions in the labs didn't get taken care of. Uh, the web languished. Uh, we had all kinds of problems. And out of that, um, I think I got at least two and a half people. Uh, the dean said, I don't really understand why it takes so much, but I trust you, Phil, and I think you're not lying to me, so you probably do need some more help. And uh, you know, and that worked out pretty well. But and we had a very nice plan, a beautiful flow chart, and all this stuff. Um, but you know, sometimes things break down in there, and uh, somebody didn't like a color on something, and it took hours to change the color. And oh, can you can you just change the tint just a little bit more? I mean, I mean we spent a week just changing the color on this thing. I don't want to go into too many details, but. Uh, We've, we've done the color thing. <laughs> anyway, any other comments on that? Uh, there's one in the back. Go ahead. Uh, I'm kind of new to the whole game here, so I may be saying something that's terribly obvious. But one of the, one of the things that, that I've seen over this last year is how many faculty uh, know exactly what we ought to be doing. <laughs> so, we've got all this stuff coming in. All oh, faculty. Why are we doing this one? What? All oh, faculty. That's right. Um, but something I've been charged with doing that I think may be effective is to put together uh, an extra law school tech advisory committee made up of uh, partners or, uh, from some of the big firms that have got a lot of technology in them, some people from Sprint, which is located in our city. Headquartered uh, there, we put together uh, eight or ten people who are movers and shakers, who also have some sense of uh, what our students might have to be able to be doing when they get out of school. 
uh, methodologies so we can have some uh, input into uh, curriculum. Um, I'd like to get somebody from uh, education who is involved in, in uh, studying the, the, the use of technology in education so that we can have instructional input. Uh, and then some of the business out there because they always seem to get about 20 years ahead of educators on what's going on uh, in these kinds of areas. And so get them in there. And I think that to get a committee like that together will bring a number of things besides their expertise and a little bit more coherent vision to see the possibilities. Uh, also their resources. I think that's a really neat idea. We have a faculty student committee that until last year was the management arm. So we do not have a committee managing IT. That was a horrible disaster. Um, but, but it helps to get lots of new ideas and then with the way I plan on using it next year, the uh, IT committee, is to get some of these faculty members to buy in. And when, like we had a faculty member come in and said he wanted smart boards everywhere and the dean thought that was a great idea. And I did some research and no, it's really not a great idea. But if we can get him to buy into some alternatives through this committee, I think then he'll go around telling everybody else on the faculty what great new media stuff we're getting. So, um, the, but to get outside on it, that's a great idea. Yeah, so often it's that, that uh, I don't know what the maxim is, but bring a consultant in to tell them what you've been telling them all along. <laughs> yeah, that, that always works. And you well. can stroke alumni, they're always looking for alumni stroking opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yeah. We just did a series of brown bags uh, this year where we brought the back together with the doctors. I think now looking into this committee and those ground backs together so the fact that they're educated by uh, judges and lawyers and people out there that kind of know what's out there. And so they can quit listening to, I saw smart boards and whatever. And when they find out that you stick a smart board in the big lecture hall, it's big enough to be seen as too big. Phil, have you got a word or two on security for us? I was going to let Mark talk about Mark? security. He's kind of passionate about it. <laughs> okay. Um, hmm. We've put in um, walk-up ports in our library where students can bring in a laptop and just plug in and get an internet connection. And we are, as I mentioned earlier, starting to put in some wireless in the law school. And we are going to put in indoor and outdoor wireless. Um, outdoor is kind of an interesting thought. That kind of opens the door to anybody pretty much walking onto our campus and, and getting a connection from us. So we've had to address security about that. Do we want anyone to just walk onto our campus and get a connection on our network? Well, no, we don't. Um, and my I'll, Danish response is, why not? And they tried to explain it to me at dinner the other night, and I still don't understand it. But they had an answer. They had an answer, so I believe it now. Well, the answer is it's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that go on in clear text. Um, passwords get crossed in, in clear text. Um, DOS attacks, denial of service attacks by someone getting onto your network and creating some machine somewhere else even, maybe not directly from their computer over a wireless network, you couldn't get much of a DOS attack, but you could create one from somewhere else. Um, I hadn't prepared for this, but there are a lot of reasons why you really wouldn't want to have someone, just anyone, get on your network. And um, so we've had to address this issue. There's some schools that are putting in for their wireless um, MAC addresses. The MAC address is a encoded code on every network card that's been ever created. With this unique code, you can program an access point that receives the signals from the wireless card to only accept MAC addresses that it knows. So you can program it to only accept your people. We use a little bit different approach at the University of Florida. Um, I, I don't want to get too technical on you, but let's just uh, leave it at when a user goes onto our campus, whether it's in a plug-in port or a wireless, all they can get to is one web screen that says, please log in. Every faculty member, every student, every staff member at the University of Florida is provided a user ID and password by this 
by the campus itself. We don't have to manage that in the law school, thank goodness. Um, and in order to get anywhere else, they have to be authenticated by entering an, a valid username and their password. Then it changes a router, which is a firewall, to allow them to get to everything else on the internet and to our network. Pretty secure sailing. We know you all are, are just about ready to go to lunch, but we want to send you, first of all, are there any last questions? We want to send you away with a smile, so we've compiled, with apologies to David Letterman, our very own <laughs> top ten list from the home office in Boston, the top ten things the IT staff wants to say to the dean. Number ten, yes, that is a new packet bell in the trash. <laughs> Number nine, no, the internet is not down. <laughs> Number eight, donuts and pizza go a long way. Number seven, you really do get what you pay for. Number six, computers age faster than faculty cars. <laughs> Number five, it's time to update your password post-it. <laughs> Number four, don't put hot drinks in the slide-out cup holder. <laughs> Number three, no, we don't service the faculty microwave. Number two, yes, a Napster server would be a great naming opportunity. And number one of the top ten things the IT staff wants to say to the dean, your laptop really is an Etch-a-Sketch. Thank you all for coming.